so happy Mother's Day. And um, I, I don't know, this morning when, uh, when the choir came and, and sang, it, uh, it kind of blew my mind because uh, I wasn't ready for it this morning. And some of you know about, I don't know, probably five or six years ago, I went to Uganda for the first time. And I, I, went, to, uh, I went to where these kids lived. Like first I went to their homes and I saw the living conditions that really blew my mind and yeah, it was the first time I had been in a, a situation like that and but then I went to the church and the choir was singing you know they had the choir all dressed up I'm like wow how'd they get so dressed up and so clean and they began to worship and and I I'll never forget the prayer that this girl prayed um, she got up and she grabbed the microphone and and she just opened our service with prayer and she said she said father thank you thank you that we are alive because so many of our friends have died and I, I remember that was so shocking to me you know growing up in America and and never really thinking that way or really dealing with death in that way but some of the things that they had seen and gone through was really blown my mind and I started talking to different people and it was it was an interesting trip to me because all of my life I could uh, I could watch those infomercials and I could see people who were starving in Africa or people who were dying of AIDS and I could watch it and I would feel bad about it but somehow I was able to get over it like I I'd have my I could somehow separate my feelings and my knowledge from my actions somehow in my mind I was totally fine with it too I didn't feel guilty I, I could just flip the channel to something else and know that there were difficult situations in the world but I somehow justified being able to just continue on with life and it's kinda like if you ever saw that movie Hotel Rwanda I don't know if any of you guys saw that great movie but in the middle of the movie uh, there these cameramen they film what's going on there and all the people that are dying and the guy from Rwanda gets so excited he's just thrilled that the cameraman got it on film because now all of America is gonna see and then the cameraman makes a statement though to the Rwandan who is so excited he goes you don't get it I don't know why you're so excited because this is what's gonna happen they'll air it in in America and people will, will you know look at it say oh those poor Africans feel bad for them and then go right back to eating their dinner and I thought man that's such a great statement because that's so me I can go on a missions trip I can you know see and know all the things that are going on but after a few moments I can go right back to life as usual and somehow I can separate my actions from my beliefs and my convictions and it, there was just something about that trip when I first went to Africa I it was the first time in my life I couldn't separate it and I go you know what I can't just keep living the way that I'm living knowing that they're living the way they're living and how many people are suffering I, I was like something has to be done like there needs to be a change there needs to be a, a change of lifestyle and I can't separate my actions from what I know what I feel what I'm convicted about and uh, not to say that I don't still do that sometime, but I remember just coming back to the church and saying, you know, you guys, this is what I saw. This is how people are living. We got to do something. And that's when the church started changing its focus from just looking at us and our needs and thinking about others. And, and that's, you know, ever since that time, we've built orphanages. We've built, uh, we, we've built uh, churches. We've built uh, schools. We, you know, we, we've, we've sponsored hundreds, literally thousands of kids have been sponsored by this church since that time and it's been cool to see us just saying you know what we don't want to separate our convictions and our knowledge from our actions we want to do something rather than fooling ourselves by just acquiring more and more knowledge and I, I guess I bring that all up because this week's been really interesting to me because I've been working on my message and and I understand the passage that I'm teaching um, but after watching the news this week about what's going on in Myanmar, you know, in Burma, the, the, the cyclone that hit, and I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, how are Christians supposed to respond to this? Do we respond by having a church service 
and ignoring it and singing some songs and, and, and teaching another passage of Scripture? Or, you know, how, how does God view this situation? Because in Myanmar right now, they say between 60 to 100,000 people have died already. Okay, that would be like if all of Simi Valley were wiped out. Okay, imagine the, tr- the ripple effect of 100,000 people, Simi Valley uh, being wiped out, everyone in Moore Park that's related to us, and Thousand Oaks, and all the surrounding areas, and all of the U.S. would know about it. It would be huge. And so I'm, I'm looking at these articles, and I'm watching these, looking at these pictures and these videos from the area, and they're saying, okay, about 100,000 people have died so far, but they're saying that there's about a million people, over a million people who have lost their homes, and so they're all just living on the streets, you know, just kind of laying there at night. And, and not only that, but they're saying, they're estimating that in the next few weeks, about half a million people will die because of the disease and the unclean drinking water and the lack of provisions and everything else. And I'm going, okay, half a million people? Like, see, the the thing is, is I used to be able to just look at that and go, oh, that's crazy, and then go on with life. And then move on, and I'm going, man, is that, how do we do that? Like, I, I, I still struggle with it because, I mean, I know the message of the cross. I've always known the message of the gospel. I understand that God, rather the Creator, Almighty God, who spoke the world into existence, He didn't just come and, and give us a little gift. He didn't just come and show us a little token of love. No, He has His Son. He gives everything and has His Son take the form of a man and have Him, and He has Him die on a cross to pay for all of our sins. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus Himself says, look, no one's taking my life from me. I'm laying it down of my own accord. He goes, I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. And I have decided that I'm going to give my life to you. So again, Jesus is not just giving us a little token of love. But instead, he's saying, you know, I'm going to give everything to you. I'm going to leave. I'm not going to consider equality with God here in heaven something that I need to hold on to. But instead, I'll humble myself. I'll make myself nothing. I'll take the form of a servant and I'll be nailed to a cross. Okay, so that is Christianity. That is the good news that God is on His throne and that God is a loving God. He's an amazing God. And He's given us everything. And so now when I become a Christian, that means I decide to follow Christ. That means I try to become like Jesus Christ. I I am His ambassador. My actions should reflect the God that I belong to. My actions should reflect my Savior. And yet for so many years, I was able to say, okay, you know what, that's what Jesus did. That's what you know, God did for me. Here are some people in need. And I feel bad for them, but not really do anything. Versus, okay, what would the Christian response be? And in the same way, I'm looking at the situation in Burma and I'm going, okay, what would God, the Creator, want his followers, you know, the Christians, the ones who are trying to emulate Jesus Christ, what would he want them to do in this situation? And, and so all week I just struggle because I'm going, okay, I don't think he would want us just to have service and sing some songs and, and move on and, and uh, you know, maybe address a situation. And I, and I struggle with it because I go, oh man, but Lord, it's Mother's Day, you know? Shouldn't I just come and give a happy mother message, you know? And that's what they're coming for. And, and, and yet the, the reality of what we do and who we are is like Jesus coming down to rescue, we're supposed to be ambassadors of his that are willing to give everything. Not leftovers, not, you know, if everything's taken care of for me, then I'll give them a little, you know, a token gift. But I'm supposed to be giving of my life. And I'm not saying I've got it figured out. I'm not saying that I'm doing all of this to perfection. I'm just saying I... I don't rest like I normally do. You know, I, I don't, I can't just block things out of my mind anymore. And I have to think, okay, what do we as a church do? Do you understand that that's the vision behind the amphitheater? Is, uh, you know, why are we looking to build this amphitheater? You know, why, why are we making more space for more people? Because Sunday mornings, we've been packed for, gosh, I don't even know how long. 
um, probably seven or eight years that we haven't been able to grow on Sunday mornings and, and people are turned away and obviously not, people aren't as excited about you know, Sunday night or, or Saturday night. We've tried all these different alternatives and you guys are the only godly ones in the church that will do this. You know? And so this idea of, okay, we know, you know, because we don't just have a passion for the rest of the world, we have a passion for Simi Valley. And I got to love the people in Simi Valley and their friends and neighbors we still have to reach. And so we can't just say, let's care for the rest of the world and forget about Simi Valley. We still need to reach them. And they come on Sunday mornings. And you guys have helped out by making space on Sunday mornings. And, and it's this whole idea of how can we reach more people without spending a lot of money. And... Uh, our best solution. We've tried the satellite things. We've tried planting churches, which we're doing, and I believe successfully. But it's a point where we go, you know what? We need to build a bigger building, but we don't want to spend the money um, because that's a lot of money to build a building that big that would seat three or 4,000 people. And so the idea was, well, let's build this amphitheater let's build this outdoor amphitheater and we'll just sit outside i mean maybe by sitting outside for an hour a week we would be mindful of the millions of people that live outside and don't have a home to retreat to and wouldn't that be a better picture of jesus if we weather some of the elements for even an hour a week to remind us of what how the rest of the world lives and to sacrifice for that sake, wouldn't that be a better picture of Jesus? And so that's the process we're going through. And just to give you an update on that, um, things look pretty good, actually. Uh, we, we resubmitted a couple of weeks ago. Um, the county has 30 days to respond, but from the inside information we're getting, it's looking pretty good. Um, but we need to keep praying, praying like crazy because they, they haven't made their final decision. And so let's keep praying in that direction. Um, at the same time, on June 15th, we have made a commitment to buy the property. And chances are we will not know yet from the county because they can, yeah, I mean, they say 30 days, but it's, they, they can do whatever they want. You know? And the, the truth is, is it, it, we probably won't get a, a decision by then. And so we have to come up with this money and we went and uh, looked for a loan and sought out a loan and we can get a loan for $5 million dollars. That's not the problem. The problem is the elders again are going, man, we just got out of debt. <laughs> you know, do we want to jump back into debt? And we were thinking, you know what? What we struggle with is we know we could come up with $5 million, right? I mean, could, could three, 4,000 people come up with, uh, with $5 million? Yes, they could. I mean, in fact, you know, just our, the stimulus package that's coming, you know, when the elders brought up, they said, you know, even if we just give those over where, you know, where each family is going to get, you know, $1,500, $2,000, just that would get us to like the $3 million mark. And so we're going, gosh, it wouldn't take a whole lot to actually pay for this thing. I mean, obviously it's a whole lot because it's $5 million. But the, the thought is, is could we do that? And can we at least pray for that and seek that? And, and just to ask you, you know, we're not begging for money. We never have. We're not going to start now. I just want you to, to pray about that. In fact, if you've noticed, even the offerings, we're not passing the plate in front of you. Eventually, we're going to have boxes at the exits, and, and you can put it in there because we want you to give cheerfully and joyfully, and it wants to be something you do rather than something you're guilted into or feel ashamed, and so you throw a couple bucks in there. God says he doesn't want that. He doesn't want giving out of compulsion, but it's something that you premeditated and thought through and said, you know what, I actually want to give to this project and so just begin praying for that because we're a month away from that date and we're going okay it's been a crazy year it's been an absolutely insane year and maybe god will lead some of you to say you know what i really want to be a part of this project and uh and to give a lump sum for that um what was i going to say i'm totally scattered now um Happy Mother's Day, uh, choir's here, uh, what do I, what, you got some ideas, <laughs> suggestions, what do you guys want me to talk about, um, oh, I know, yeah, 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 what, no, I, I don't know, I'm confused, here's what I do want to do, um, going back to the thing, I, 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 I go on tangents, if you've ever noticed, um, but this, this whole thing with what's going on in Burma, or if you want to call it Myanmar, whatever. it's actually Myanmar is a technical name. I guess there is no Burma anymore. 
um, but it was the artist formerly known as Burma. Um, and, and so I, I'd like us to spend some time praying because here's the struggle too, because as elders, we have this huge responsibility where we have all this money, right? And the Lord has just blown our minds this year with as we've cared for the poor, he's taken care of all our needs and even enabled us to pay off our debt. And it's just been an amazing, amazing year where we've given away half of everything that comes in, leaves the church, and, and it's been our best year financially ever. We don't get it. It just, it just happened that way. And, uh, and yet we're looking at this building and going, this seems like the best way to do it is if we can come up with this money. But then you hear about these tragedies around the world and you go, oh, well, maybe we can, uh, you know, give more to them and then we'll still have enough money. You know, so just, just pray for us as we are really seeking after God and saying, Lord, are we, th- these are your resources. These are your people. We just want to do the right thing with it. Please pray for the elders as uh, we make some decisions in the next couple of weeks. But um, I thought right now it would be good for us just to not think about ourselves for maybe two minutes and, uh, and just focus all of our attention on the people that are in Myanmar. Um, for, you know, a million people that are homeless tonight and sleeping out in the mud. Um, and not only that, but they're grieving because they've all lost family members and loved ones. And I, I just thought it'd be good if we took a couple of minutes um, and maybe if you could get in groups of like five or six people. And don't worry, you don't all have to pray. You know, if you feel uncomfortable praying, don't pray. I, I, we just want like one or two people in each group just to, just to, um, just to volunteer and say, you know what, I'll pray for uh, the people in Myanmar. So um, if you guys can get in groups of five and six and uh, someone just um, volunteer to lead in prayer for those people. Father, we just, we lift up these people in Myanmar right now. God, sometimes we come to a point like this and we just don't even know what to pray. God, we've never experienced anything like that. The despair, the pain, the weeping, the wailing, the death every day. God, I honestly don't know what to pray right now. I I just ask that you would use us, Lord, somehow in this situation to figure out what we can do and and how we can come alongside of them. And God, I just pray that that would be the desire of our hearts too, God, just to figure out a way to um, represent you well in the midst of this crisis. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Just so you know, I did contact Dave Phillips over at Children's Hunger Fund to find out, okay, what, what exactly is being done? And right then when I called him, he actually had a pastor from Myanmar in his office, and they're working out and figuring out how we're going to get aid over there through the local church. And so hopefully we'll have some more direction next week. And for now, I would just say just pray for the elders as we figure out how to allot the funds that you guys have already given and try to figure out what... I mean, there's so many things going on in the world that you can give to, you know, and so it's difficult to just pray through and try to prioritize when there's people in so much need. Um, but uh, if you guys remember, we were, um, we were teaching through Galatians 5, and I do want to get into the Word tonight, and I do want to share this passage because I... I, I think it is pertinent, and I, I do think it's very important that we understand this. Um, if you remember, we were teaching through the book, book of Galatians, and we got through chapter 5, and then we took like a month break where we spoke about community, and we talked about this need to love one another, and this idea that this is the, this is the great command, to love your neighbor as yourself, and we need to start doing that in our neighborhoods, with the other believers, um, with, with the people in our community, to reach the community. Um, and now we get back into Galatians 6, and, and the reason why we did that, and even breaking it right there, is you really needed that backdrop to understand chapter 6, because Galatians 6 explains that by you caring for the other people in the church and other people in your neighborhood, it doesn't just mean physical needs. 
Okay, sometimes when we talk about community, we're saying, hey, this person's in need, they need a refrigerator. Okay, who's got a refrigerator? Let's give it to them. You know, this person is a single mom, she needs help taking care of her lawn, who's going to do that? Okay, great. You know, these people overseas, they need some vitamins, they need some clothes, let's take care of that. It's, it goes beyond that, though, and the Bible says it's not just when you see your brother or sister in physical need, but here in chapter 6, it, it explains how you and I have a responsibility to each other when we see each other in spiritual need, when we see other people in sin. And I know this, is go, this kind of flies in the face of the way most people do church, but I feel like we've completely missed the boat on this one. Galatians 6, verse 1, it says this. It says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, why I say we missed it is because the Bible commands us. Okay, when it says if someone's caught in a sin, it says you who are spiritual should restore him gently. In the Greek, it's actually a command. It's an imperative. That means if you see someone in sin, if you really are a godly person, you'll actually go and help that person with their sin. In fact, you are commanded to go and help that person with their sin. And, and I say we missed it because typically we believe that, no, if I confront someone on their sin i'm judging them and the bible says don't judge them you guys th the bible teaches that if someone's in sin we're supposed to go and actually help them and restore them in their sin to actually help solve the problem in fact you actually what judging him means judging him is when you don't do anything Judging is, is when you form an opinion and you don't care enough to actually help restore that person. Judging is the person who sits back and says, yeah, that person's a hypocrite and establishes that in his mind but doesn't actually do anything to help that person. That's judging because you're, you're placing a judgment. You're not actually helping the individual. And here it's saying that if someone's caught in a sin, that we have responsibility, and that's to restore him gently. And the word restore is the word they would use when a net is ripped open. You know, this idea of mending it back together. Or if a bone was broken, and you, you maybe had to break it again and get it, you know, and then, and then fix it. It's actually the word that was used if, uh, if your, your uh, arm came out of socket like came out of joint. I don't know if any of you ever dislocated a shoulder. Let me just bring back those memories. And, and you know, and what do you do when it's just dangling there? Someone's got to grab it and oh, yank it back in, back into its socket. And I say that because I don't want you to misunderstand this word gently. Okay? You don't quite do that gently. The word gently here means humbly. It's literally the word humbly because there are times when you confront someone on their sin and it's got to be difficult. It's got to be hard, but it is our responsibility to go and talk to these people. Um, you see, the legalist is going to just condemn that person and judge that person and even gossip about that person and talk about that person's sin. But the Bible says that we have a responsibility to actually help that person. Um, and it's no secret that in churches there's plenty of gossip that goes on. Um, and we talk about each other's sin, and, and that's so wrong. What the Bible says is that we're supposed to actually go to that individual directly and help them with it. And I just want to challenge you to something, because you will hear gossip if you're alive. You'll hear people that gossip, right, and talk negatively about someone else. I just challenge you, when you hear something negative said about someone else, and it's from a Christian that, that you ask that person the question, what have you done to help her in that area? Just ask that simple question. Oh, okay, that's what she's doing. What have you done to help her? Because that's our responsibility. Those of us who are spiritual, those who are walking with God, since we're, what have we done to restore? Because that's our responsibility. And, and to ask that question, then to ask a second question, to, to say, okay, how does your telling me help him or help her okay how's this helping the situation because we're if we are judges then then yeah then let's talk let's gossip let's be judgmental over these people 
But if we're really caring and spiritual, then we'll actually go to those people and help them and only speak the things that are helpful. I'm telling you, if there's just a few of you that are willing to speak up when people gossip and ask those two questions of how are you helping them and how does this help them, I'm telling you, if we're willing to ask those two questions, the gossip will stop. I mean, imagine, imagine you going to someone with gossip and them asking you the question, hey, how have you helped that person with that sin? And then for them to ask you, hey, and how did this help that person with their sin? Because we gotta, we got to come alongside this person. That's, that's our brother. You see, you have a responsibility to me as your Christian brother. That if you see a sin in my life, you don't just let me go. See, we, 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 we have this thing because we don't want to care for someone. We don't want to get in their lives. We don't really want to help them restore their lives. So, so we kind of say, well, I'm just going to, you know, the most loving thing to do is not to judge them and just leave them alone. You guys, that's not what the Bible says. The most loving thing is to go come alongside of them and say, look, I'm not going to let you ruin your life. I'm not going to let you just go down this path. Because it's interesting, this, this idea of someone being caught in a sin, the word here for being caught in a sin is actually a passive verb. It's kind of interesting because it, it's the idea that this isn't an individual that has premeditated his sin and thought through. You know how we do that sometimes? Let's just be honest. There's times, there have been those times in our lives when we did something wicked and we actually thought about it ahead of time. We knew we were going to lie, and we did it anyways. We knew it was wrong. We knew God didn't want this. We maybe even had a week to think about it, and we decided to sin against God. It was premeditated. But then there were other times when, and it seems to be what this is referring to, where we almost get caught in a sin in the sense that we weren't looking for it. It just kind of fell in our lap. It was right in our face. The temptation hit us at the moment, and we kind of jumped in, and, and it's still our fault. We still made the choice. I, I'm, not, I'm not making any excuses here, you know, because the Bible says we are never tempted beyond what we can handle, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Never. Every time we sin, it's our fault. We've got to get that through our heads. Every time you sin, it's your fault. You can't blame it on someone. You can't blame it on the situation. It's your fault. God says that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle. But with the temptation, there's always a way of escape. But there are those times in our lives when, you know what I'm talking about, you really want to follow God. You're really seeking after God. A temptation hits you and you fall into it. And and the way sin happens is you get more and more entangled in it. And the Bible says when you see your brother or your sister get caught in a sin like that, if you're spiritual, according to verse, you know, chapter 5, where it says you're keeping in step with the Spirit, you're living by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, the Holy Spirit is in your life, then you who are spiritual should see that person, that brother or sister, and care to restore them. That means help fix this area in their life that's broken. Help bring it back into submission. And and the Bible says, but watch yourself or you too may be tempted. And what he's referring to there is, is going back to that word gently or the word humbly. It's this temptation to become proud. And you'll see that in verses three and four. But it's it's watch yourself because you can become proud in this process. You can be tempted. Um, In verse 2, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. See, again, we're commanded here. It says, carry each other's burdens. See, it's it's, it's one of these things where, I don't know if you remember the video we showed about a month or, or so ago, and Josh Walker was on there, and he was talking about how we have to stop looking at people's problems and saying, well, that's her problem, and I'm going to help her with it. No, instead we need to go, you know what, that's our problem. Because we're a family, we're a body. And so, you know what, your sin is our problem. My sin is our problem problem and we need to look at it that way and say you know what we got to carry each other's burdens because aren't there times aren't there times in life when you really are trying to walk walk with God you want to do the right thing and and yet temptation is so so intense 
There are times when you're really trying to live the way God wants you to, and it's like you start hearing these voices in your head, you start getting tempted, and everything you're tempted by is right there in your face, and everything inside of you is screaming out, just go, just do it, just sin, just lie, just steal, just, you know, whatever it is, just do it, just look, just... And the Bible says, you know what? That's a burden. There's, a, there's this heavy burden, and we need to somehow help one another in this area. We're not meant to do this on our own. And this word for burden is the, is the, is a, it's, it's the word heaviness. It's this idea of something that's extremely heavy. But then he goes on. Well, you know what? Before I go on, let me just ask you this. So knowing what this verse says, can you think of someone in your life Who's a Christian who's caught up in sin right now? The answer is yes, right? I mean, if you have any friends, then uh, you, 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 you know of people that have been caught up in sin or Christians right now that are caught up in their sin. And this is what I, I don't want to see happen is, are you just going to walk away from that and separate your actions from your convictions and your knowledge? Like, are you actually going to leave here tonight and say, you know, I'm going to help restore that person. I'm going to go talk to that person. I'm going to make their sin my sin and say, let's walk through this thing together. Not in a judgmental way, but in a loving way, in a caring way. Not in an arrogant way, but it's to say, you know what, I've got issues too, and I need your help with those things. And we're supposed to carry and deal with our sins. See, we've made sin like this private thing where we don't share it with anyone else. And it's my issue, and if someone talks to me about it, then they're judging me. That's not, that's not Bible's intention. The Bible says, you know, you carry one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ, the law of Christ, which is to love one another. It's the most loving thing you can do. The most loving thing you can do for someone is not feed them when they're hungry. That is loving. It's when they're, the most loving thing is when they're walking away from the Lord and you actually bring them back to repentance. And bring them back to the ways of God. That's the, that's the greatest act of love you can show someone. Then in verse 3. Oh no, you know what? Let me go back again. Okay, here's, here's the thing too. I got to just say this and we'll move on. Here's the excuse I hear a lot. Is how can I help someone else when I have so many issues myself? Right? Haven't you thought that? I've got so much sin in my own life. How am I going to help someone else with their sin? Okay, so what are you going to wait for? Are you going to wait till you don't sin anymore? And people go, well, you know what? It's not just me. It's also my family, my own kids. I got enough to deal with with my own kids. Okay, so, so we're all going to wait until our kids don't sin anymore and we don't sin anymore. Then we'll help other people with their sins. You understand how it just breaks down? Because the truth is, is, the Bible is saying, you know what? No, you just seek to help other people. You'd be amazed at how much your own issues clear up if you take your mind off of yourself and you start helping other people and they start helping you. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. Now we really will go to verse 3. And uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to get through the whole passage because I rambled about a bunch of stuff. Um, but I did that at every service. So um, you'd think I'd figure it out by 5 o'clock. But I didn't. Verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, I love this verse. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Does anyone here, do you guys know of someone like that? Yeah? Isn't it weird how we all know of someone like that, but it's never us? Um, <laughs> It's none of us, but we all know him. Um, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to anyone else. This verse is just saying, you know, for those who are arrogant and are going around pointing out everyone else's flaws, he says, why don't you test your own actions? And not test your own actions comparing them to someone else, because we can all play that game. And every time I do marital counseling, that's the whole game you play. Well, yeah, but you should have seen what she did. And we just compare, compare, compare to justify our actions. And he says...